Koinonia House is a nonprofit Christian ministry that is supported by the purchasing of materials and donations. To learn more about Koinonia House and the materials that we have available, visit khouse.org. And please be responsible in the sharing and dissemination of this information and respect the copyrights therein. Thank you. We're gathered here to explore eternal security. How sure can we really be? This is one of the more controversial aspects of our commitment to the Bible. And there are good people on both sides of this perspective. But in support of our book, The Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory, this issue uh, has to be dealt with right up front. And so we thought it would be appropriate to explain why we hold this particular view. But I am reminded of an interesting evening. I, was, I taught the uh, Monday night Bible studies at Calvary Chapel for about 25 years. And one evening, as we usually did when I was through, there'd be a smaller crowd that would gather around just with some informal questions and answers. And there was one guy who had his little following with him there. And you could tell that he was looking for an argument. And uh, if there's a sincere question, I try to answer it. But when they're just trying to be, you know, confrontational. I, I was tired, and I was just not in the mood to get into, the, and it was clear what he wanted to attack was eternal security. And uh, he said, well, and, you know, can I lose my salvation? And I just, partly out of fatigue and maybe partly out of mischief, I says, yeah, I think you can. And it was interesting to observe what happened, because he was so sure that I was going to rise to the bait and defend the view of eternal security, and I just didn't. I just granted, no, I guess you can. And I watched him actually turn pale. He wanted to fight. He expected, he wanted me to defend the eternal security point of view. And he just, he didn't want, you know, he he didn't know where to go. And his following around him was looking ahead and wondering, okay, what's what's he going to do now? You know, because he had a little cadre there. And as I, I I suddenly realized, by the grace of God, by the Holy Spirit, maybe, um, I had struck gold because I didn't fight him. I left him there. And as he tried to, he was looking for an argument. I wouldn't argue. No, I think you can. I think you lose your salvation. And I realized I had him. He he was where he wanted to be, but he didn't want to be left there. You with me? And I finally, of course, because there are other people around too, I says, you may be able to lose yours. I can't lose mine. Because I know in whom I've believed, and I hit it hard, you know, from, from that point on. But I remember that so vividly. It was interesting to see him want to argue, and yet when he won his argument, he was almost in panic. It was interesting, interesting. So uh, we're going to explore eternal security. And what's really at stake here? A great deal. First of all, of course, our assurance in a very special way. The uh, Apostle John in his first letter says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. That ye may know, not hope for, not suspect, not just believe. No, the word know is there. So, also, this is essential for the concept of forgiveness. Because how many of your sins were yet future while Jesus hung on that cross? And the answer, of course, is all of them. Not only the ones up to the point when you believed, but the ones that you're going to stumble through next week. They were all future at that cross. Every one of them. We want to remember that. So forgiveness is that issue here. Faith alone is underscored here. There is no room for any of us doing any boasting in heaven. We're there, we're before the throne entirely by faith, not by any contributions that we've made to the completed work of Christ. It also is essential to really understand God's love, which is unconditional love. If there is a condition, even just one, attached to God's willingness to maintain a relationship with his children, then it's not unconditional. It's conditional. 
The other thing is that, that is at stake here with this view is the whole issue of avoiding the traps of legalism. And this is especially prevalent in a day when many of us are discovering the joys and the depth of our Jewish roots. And as we embrace some of these messianic fellowships and so forth, it's interesting how many people find themselves drawn to get back under the law, drawn into what is called legalism. And that is a form of self-deception. We can't contribute to what Christ completed. And that's actually a form of pride, strangely enough. Pride can rear its head in some surprising ways. The whole issue here in the doctrine of eternal security is to focus on Christ. And that's all through the scripture. We'll be examining many of those as we go. I'm very fascinated that Socrates, five centuries B.C., is recorded as saying, it may be that deity can forgive sins, but I don't see how. He was perceptive enough to realize that God in his righteousness has a problem forgiving sin because that would compromise his righteousness. It has to be paid for. He understood that. He couldn't see the, the, the approach that God has in, established in his Redeemer. But this whole area of guilt removal is part of the issue here. Charles Rari says there are only three options open to God as a, a, a sinners stand in his courtroom. Only three options. He must condemn them. That's option one. He might compromise his own righteousness to receive them just the way they are. That's not likely it would violate his nature. Or the third option, he can change them into righteous people. How does he do that? If he can exercise somehow the third option then he can announce them righteous, which is what we call justification. That's what the word justification, declaring them righteous on some basis, a basis that doesn't compromise his righteousness. So that's called imputation. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he, God hath made him, Jesus, God hath made Jesus to be sin for us who know no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We have no ability to understand what that means. That the Lord Jesus, pure, righteous, sinless, was made sin for us in our place. We have no capacity to even grasp what that is. We don't, you can't fully comprehend his purity on the one sense, and we certainly don't really even begin to embrace our filthiness as sinners on the other. That gulf is gigantic, and yet that's God hath made him to be sin for us. Key idea underscoring everything else. When did God do that? Well, he hung on the cross, Mark 15. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Which being interpreted is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was the only time throughout eternity that he didn't call him Father. He couldn't, because he was in our place. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was predicted, of course, all through the Old Testament, but most notably in Isaiah 53, where it's recorded that, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin... He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. That's what the word justification means. And he justified many. In Hebrews chapter 9, but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. That's where he did it, right there. The opening passages in John's Gospel highlight that, speaking of Jesus, he came unto his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. 
Sons of God, that's a term reserved in the Bible for a direct creation of God. It's used for angels in the Old Testament. But here again, it's a new creation. That's where we use the term born again. It'll be explained in chapter 3 of John. Even them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, none of those, but of God, by the will of God. Born of God. Romans 4, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That justifieth the ungodly. That's us. And this is all summarized, recapped in, John, in uh, Romans chapter 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How are we justified? By faith. Not by anything we do, but by faith. Colossians chapter 2 is one of my favorite passages on this because I think it's so graphic. Paul says, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances. Strange term. It also could be translated the certificate of debt. Blotting out your debt, the certificate of debt, that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. This is an allusion to a practice of the legal system in those days in which if you were condemned before a court, you had a debt to society. And you served that debt by serving in your prison, say, uh, let's assume you've been sentenced to five years. The jailer kept a certificate, and every year that you served, it would be checked off there. And when you were completed, he would sign it off and give it to you. If by chance, halfway through, you escaped, what was left on that certificate was his to finish for you. That's why the, uh, the, uh, the jailer in Philippi was ready to commit suicide when they found the jail, all the cells were open because he thought they'd run off and he would be stuck. They said, no, no, we're still here. And they sang praises. And of course, he got saved. You know the story. Our certificate of debt. Now, when it gets paid, what they wrote across it then, the jailer would sign it off as paid in full. The term in the Greek is tetelestai. And that's exactly what Jesus declared as he hung on that cross. Translated in John 19, verse 30, um, it is finished. Tetelestai, paid in full. There is no double jeopardy here. That certificate that was signed off, that you kept with you, was your protection against ever serving any kind of penalty for that crime. It had been paid in full. And the penalty that you and I are due, or were due, um, has been paid in full by Jesus Christ. And you can't add to that. To try to add to what he completed is a form of blasphemy, surprisingly enough. Romans 3 says, I, To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, that the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. To try to be justify yourself by the deeds of the law is to deny the justification that's already been determined before the court. As we get into this, Earl Rademacher is famous. He, he loves to come in to these meetings. He says, I have been saved. I am being saved. And I will be saved. And that's just his way of provoking the reality that salvation has at least three tenses. And I'll call this the paradigm of salvation. The past tense of salvation we call justification. That's a gift of God, of everlasting life received by faith alone in Christ alone. That's it, period, nothing else. The gift of God, of everlasting life received by faith alone by Christ alone. That's the past tense. The present tense, something that's going on right now, we call sanctification. That's a work in progress that involves faith and the works of the believer. Every one of us are a work in progress. Every one of us are incomplete in terms of our sanctification. That's present tense. And present tense is a continuing tense. And of course, the future tense is we call glorification. 
That's the result of the previous two aspects. All believers will be glorified, that is, res in the resurrected body, uh, just like Christ. But some will have more glory or reward than others. That doesn't mean they're all equal, but they're all glorified. Those are the three tenses. The past tense, separation from the penalty of sin. We call that justification. Present tense, separation from the power of sin. An unbeliever doesn't have power of sin. You and I do through the Holy Spirit. Separation from the power of sin, we call that sanctification. That's also a work of God. And the future tense, of course, is separation from the very presence of sin. And we looked at that, we call that glorification. Those three terms, past, present, and future, are the tenses, if you will, of the word salvation. We tend to discourage the use within our institute of that term salvation because it's ambiguous. It can mean many different things. Being more, being more precise will avoid a lot of conflicts and so forth. Justification is for us. Sanctification is in us. Justification declares the sinner righteous. Sanctification makes the sinner righteous. Justification removes the guilt and penalty of sin. Sanctification removes the growth and power of sin. Very different, each, each of those. Eternal security. Well, can a man lose his salvation is the question before us. Yes, he can, if it depends on him. Fortunately, it does not. See, the Arminian is the one that denies that the true child of God is eternally secure. The Arminians have that view. The Calvinist insists that if he does not persevere in holiness, he was never regenerate in the first place. So it's not just eternal security. Part of what's involved here is what they call a perseverance of the saints. The Arminian says you've got to be, you're eternally secure only if you behave yourself all the way. The Calvinist says that if you don't behave yourself all the way, you really weren't saved in the first place. So even though they're opposites, they sort of end up in the same place. And uh, there's been 400 years of tension between these opposing theological positions. And uh, there are good scholars on both sides of this issue, by the way, even today. Along the, uh, many on the landscape are in one camp or the other. We believe it this all uh, appears to be the result of a failure to be precise, a failure to distinguish between justification on the one hand and the possibility of different inheritances or rewards on the other. So the Calvinism, eternal security, and uh, the perseverance saints, and some uh, uh, theologians call that experimental predestinarians. In other words, you're predestinated, but you don't find out until the end whether you were. So what good is it, so to speak? So that's, they call them experimental. Uh, you, you find out if you've been predestinated by experiencing to the end. The Arminians is just the opposite. Only those that persevere to the end are saved. See, what this both overlooks is there is a middle ground, and that's the view we, we lean to. We'll call it the overcomers. We believe in eternal security in terms of justification, but there's a distinction between entering heaven and inheriting. And uh, we'll be talking about very, there's a high variation of rewards among the saved. And we'll talk about that. Hebrews 3.14 uses a very interesting word. It says, for we are partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. The word partakers there is metakoi. One who shares in, participates in. And uh, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Very key word here. There's an if there. If there, if we do that, we'll be at Metacoy. So the partaker or true child of God is obligated to persevere. That's Paul's word in Romans 8, 12. But he might not. If he does not, he does not forfeit salvation. But he faces discipline in time and the loss of reward at the judgment seat of Christ that's referred to in 2 Corinthians 5.10. But it's interesting, as we approach this whole issue of eternal security, we'll discover that all three persons of the Godhead, the Trinity, have a share in preserving to fruition that which God has determined already. The basis of our eternal security depends on God the Father. The basis of our eternal security depends on God the Son. And the basis of our sec eternal security depends on God the Holy Spirit. All three are active participants in that security that we're exploring here. Let's take the first one, God the Father. It depends, first of all, our, our, our security depends upon His sovereign purpose. His eternal purposes declared in Ephesians 1, verse 11 to 12. It was anchored within the veil, confirmed by an oath in Hebrews 6. 
our eternal security depends upon his solemn promise. Our salvation depends on his promise and not our faithfulness. Romans 4.16 says, Therefore it is of faith, meaning nothing on man's part, that it might be by grace, everything on God's part, to the end that the promise might be sure. His promise is made sure because it's not, it doesn't rely on us entirely on him. That's, that's what I mean by grace. If it depended at any point upon human ability to continue to believe, then the promise wouldn't be secure. If there's a way to mess it up, I'd find a way to mess it up if it depended on me. The promise that those who believe will be saved is confirmed everywhere. Back in Genesis 15, 6, it was attributed to Abraham. He believed God was counted to him for righteousness. John 3, 60, the most famous verse in the entire Bible. And on it goes. There's dozens of those. It also depends upon God's infinite power. He is now, thanks to the, the um, commitment of Jesus Christ, he is now free to save us. He can save us because the sin has been paid for. He's not compromising his righteous nature by uh, declaring us righteous. Christ's death has rendered God free to save us in spite of our moral imperfection. Our eternal security does not depend upon our moral worthiness is the whole point here. Christ is the propitiation for our sins. And I love that definition of grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ's willingness to pay that price freed God to be able to forgive us and receive us because it was paid for. That's, that's real love. To assume that there's some sin sufficiently serious which causes us to forfeit our salvation is to assume that we were less worthy of salvation after committing this sin than before. And that reduces salvation then down to the human ability to merit it, which flies in the face of the entire Bible cover to cover. He has, the Father has purposed to keep us saved. Not only to save us, but to keep us saved. And this is my favorite part of this whole thing. John chapter 6, all, Jesus being, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Wow. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the will of the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again the last day. If one of us that were saved can lose your salvation, Jesus blew it. He can boast to the Father, of those that you give, give me, I should lose none. Zero. I should lose nothing. That's the, that's the Lord's commitment. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. It's not everlasting if you can blow it. And I will raise him up at the last day. But here's my favorite verse on this whole issue. Two verses. John chapter 10, verse 28 and 29. Jesus continuing here, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The word never there is a double negative in the Greek. In the English, a double negative contradicts itself. But in Greek, it's a way of emphasis. And the double negative here is a form that's especially emphatic. And I will give unto them eternal life, and they shall Never, 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 never perish. Is what you would say. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So you're in Christ's hand, right? My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I want you to notice here, who's the first hand? Jesus. Who's the second hand in view here? The Father's. There's two hands. I used to always hold it like this. My friend Brian in, in Auckland always says, no, it's more like this. But okay, I'm not going to quibble. There's two hands involved. That's the key. There are two hands involved. The Father and the Sons. Which leads me, if I can um, quote my impish friend Walter Martin, if you can lose your salvation, I have a new name for God. Butterfingers. Now, that's the kind of irreverent point that Walter was fond of making, but you'll remember that, won't you? See, the issue is in God's hand, not yours, if you're his. 
So it depends upon his sovereign purpose. It depends on his solemn promise. It depends on his infinite power. It depends on his much more love. His intent is love-based. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Undeserving. We contributed nothing to this. God chose to. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Wow. God knew when he saved us that we were totally depraved. And we were. And therefore, any new manifestation of sin in our lives after our conversion cannot be any motivation to God to change his mind and withdraw his grace and his salvation. Because he wasn't caught by surprise. He knew that from the beginning. All our sins were yet future. He saved us for reasons that are totally independent of us and outside of us. Not because we merited it in any way. He was motivated by his electing love and not by observation of any good in the sinner. The fifth aspect that our, our security depends on the Father is upon his answer to the prayer of his Son. See, you know, believers are called many things in the Scripture. Saints, believers, elect, sheep, partakers, and so forth. What's the dearest label that Christ uses of us? The dearest one. The title most dear to the heart of Christ, those whom thou hast given me. We often call the disciples' prayer the Lord's Prayer. That's what most people call the Lord's Prayer. It's really a prayer for the disciples. The real Lord's, Lord's Prayer is John 17, a whole chapter, which is our little window into the intimacy between the Father and the Son, where Jesus prays to the Father. In that high priestly prayer, seven times he refers to us as those whom thou hast given me. Verse 2, thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life as many as thou hast given him. I have manifested thy name unto the men whom thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. This is verse 6. Verse 9, uh, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Fascinating. He doesn't pray for the world. Ooh, that's interesting. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And down to verse 11, and now I am no more of the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep, notice he passes the, passes the responsibility here. Holy Father, keep thou thine own name, those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Wow. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Obviously, Judas is ex footnoted here as an exception, of course. Father, that I, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. His favorite, his favorite label for us is the one that the Father um, gave, it, gave him. I believe the Father always answers the prayers of the Son, and, he, and the, the Son just passed the responsibility for our security to the Father. There's a chain of five links that Paul details for us in Romans 8, verses 29 to 30. Five unbreakable links here. God's entire sovereign purpose is exemplified in just two verses in the book of Romans. Chapter 8, verse 29 and 30. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, I love what Spurgeon quipped here. He's quoted by many since then, but Spurgeon had this cute quip. God chose me before I was born. I'm glad he did, because otherwise he might have changed his mind. <laughs> and of course he's kidding. Uncertainty about your election can arise from some kind of self-righteousness. If you have uncertainty about your security in Christ, it has its roots probably in some form of pride. Be careful with that one. But continuing, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. The eternal choice and foreknowledge involves more than just establishing a relationship between God and believers. 
It involves the certainty, not just of our justification, but of our sanctification that comes as a surprise to many. Those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, Romans 8.29. Five links. Foreknowledge, predestination, called, justified, glorified. Five links there. They are, they exemplify the history in the Scripture. God's knowledge, of course, is foreknown. And then we have Abraham, Isaac, and Abraham was predestinated. Isaac, in his seed, in Abraham's seed, shall uh, his, his purpose be called. That's in Genesis 21. It's in Hebrews 11. It's also in Romans 9 that Isaac is, is, is idiomatic of being called. Jacob is justified. If God can justify that conniving character, that gives us all a, a, a sigh of relief. Would you buy a used car from Jacob? I don't think so. And uh, so if God can justify Jacob, he can justify any of us. So Abraham is predestinated, Isaac's called, Jacob's justified, and of course Joseph is glorified. And uh, many uh, analysts believe that in Paul's mind as he put those five labels out there, he, had, he, he paralleled that with the patriarchs as exemplifying each one of those. But let's go through this. Foreknowledge. The process starts there. The entire group is brought into God's eternal plan by divine foreknowledge, and the choice is predestined, predetermined. Ephesians hits this also, chapter Ephesians chapter 1, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And uh, predestined, simply planned in advance, that's all it means, it's pretty simple. And Ephesians also de develops this in its first chapter, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. That's when God first started dealing with you. Before the world was created, he had you on his mind as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. We're accepted because we're in Christ. Okay, then we're called. That's a call to come to him. That's what John 10, 27 we looked at in Romans in 1, 6. And then he justifies, de simply declare, that's, that's a judicial procedure. He's de they're declared righteous. And that's, we went look at Romans 5, 1 and those. And then, of course, whom he justified, then he also glorified. And that's all through the Scripture as the fifth step. This is a clear statement of the eternal security of the saints with these five unbreakable links detailed by Paul in Romans 8. There is another way to look at this, the paradigm of divine uh, volition, foreknowledge, election, predestination. They have their Greek words, we don't have to get into that particularly, but foreknowledge determines election. By knowing how it's all going to come out, he knows how to vote, so to speak, okay? And uh, predestination brings to pass the election. What you like, predestination makes it happen. Election looks back to foreknowledge, and predestination looks forward to destiny. It's simply a chain, again, of the divine volition. There, are, there is an example of election. Israel as a nation was elected and not for any merit that it had. In fact, in Ezekiel chapter 36, he details the fact that the reason they're going to be restored and so forth isn't because they deserve it. It's because his name is on the deal. And the church, same thing, was elected. Not because of its, any, any of its merit. It's just his choice. Individually were... Uh, chosen, elected, according to the foreknowledge of God, First Peter. Holy of grace, not of merit. We don't deserve to be elected. He just chose to that out of his volition. And also of the ones that, uh, of these, so, some are chosen for himself for, uh, or, or, and for a distinctive service. There's lots of examples of that. Predestination has to do with God's purpose with his people. It refers only to those that are saved. Election, the people of God, predestination, the purposes of God, their ministries, if you will. Okay, we've talked about the Father. The base of our eternal security depends on God the Son also. In Romans chapter 8, the question is raised, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who maketh intercession for us. So the guy that paid the bill is standing in the courtroom and is arguing on our behalf. 
God, uh, Jesus is God's appointed judge. In John 5, Acts 17, elsewhere. Jesus is whom the believer has trusted for salvation. I don't trust myself, I trust him. And furthermore, he is the one that died. More than that, he was raised to life and who sit at the right hand of God. And of course, there's dozens of passages that reiterate that. And perhaps more important than any of that, he is right now as we sit here, presently, interceding on our behalf. He's up there as our defense counsel. You think he's capable? You think he's got leverage with the boss? I think so. Who is he that condemneth? Paul gives four answers, and each of them are taught elsewhere in the Scripture, but they're all gathered here in Romans 8, verse 34. Christ died, he was risen, he advocates, and he intercedes. Four different answers. Who can condemn us? If God has already justified the man who believes in Jesus, how can he lay anything to the charge of his already justified one? That's called double jeopardy. No way. His justification comes from the imputed righteousness of Christ and is legally ours. It is not a subject of merit. Therefore, it can't be lost by demerit. Like a father, God can and does correct his earthly sons, but they always remain his sons. Remember the prodigal son. He blew it. He was still welcome home. He never lost his son. He may have lost his inheritance. He never lost his sonship. Key, key, key point that's made by that example. Okay, it depends on God the Son upon his substitutionary death. Who can condemn us if the penalty has already been paid? The greatest proof of eternal security is this whole idea of justification by faith alone. Justification refers to how God sees us and, to, and no one else. It is entirely a forensic or legal matter. It's simply declaring us right. When we trust Christ, we haven't changed, but we are declared righteous at that point because God is free to do so because it's been paid. The redemption is eternal and once and for all. And that's the epistle of Hebrews is rich in hammering that home. And of course, it depends upon his substitutionary life. Again, that's all through the book of Romans. And it's also dependent upon his present session. He's our advocate and our intercessor as we sit here. And he saves to the uttermost. You know, it's interesting, the Arminians fear, feel or fear that this doctrine we're suggesting will lead us to sin more. John says just the opposite. It's a motivation to not to sin and uh, out of respect and gratitude. Hebrews 7 says, and they, were truly many, and, and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, he's contra contrasting him to the Levitical priesthood, and this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood there, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. His term of office doesn't expire. He's not being replaced. He's there to assure our situation. And I love 1 Timothy 1.12. For the which cause I also, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I have committed my eternity into his hands. And I think he's capable and uh, it's secure. If it depended on me, it would not be secure. That's scary. That would terrify me. Because if there's a way to mess it up, I will. He is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Well, there's one more here in the Trinity. It depends upon God, the Holy Spirit. And boy, we can spend hours on this one alone. It depends on the ministry of regeneration. That's all through the Scriptures. Upon his baptizing ministry, and that's all through the Scriptures. We'll focus on just one, his sealing ministry in 2 Corinthians and all through Ephesians. What do we mean by sealing? Well, Jesus' tomb was sealed. What did that mean? It was no one else could break it open. It was sealed. Satan is sealed in the Abuso for a thousand years in Revelation 20. Several books in the Scripture are sealed. The seal, sealing has an a, a efficacious aspect to this. The 144,000 are sealed during the tribulation. A sealing ministry. If one person who is born again in Christ ever fails to enter heaven when he dies, then God will have broken his pledge. He will lose more than the person that uh, than the person did. 
because he will lose his good name. There are no conditions mentioned. It's a work of God and depends upon him alone. Let's go through some of these. In 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1, who hath sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Sealed us. Fragezio. A, a set a seal of protection and ownership. For example, like the tomb of Christ, it was, it was Pilate's seal. He had the authority to do that. Earnest. And had given the earnest of the Spirit. Araban. This is a legal concept. It's a down payment that seals the bargain. The first installment with which a man secures a legal claim upon a thing as yet unconsummated. You go to a store and you like a certain thing, you put a down payment on it, they can't sell to somebody else. It, it, you've got that claim on it. It's a, it's a pledge, in effect. That's, what, that's the term being used here. It's like a down payment, a deposit, or a pledge. It's evidence of good faith, obligating the party to consummate the commitment involved. The Holy Spirit is designated as a down payment or first fruits to be followed by more in Romans 8 and elsewhere. So he was sealed us, earnest, and so forth. In Ephesians, it says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, ye were sealed with what? The Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Wow. How long does that endure? That sealing endures till, all the way till we get our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Ephesians 4 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed and sealed. There again is that word sealed. And uh, used like a, also as a boundary marker. When the Holy Spirit seals, it is with the signet ring of Father in our hearts. He leaves His mark of ownership. How long are we sealed? Is it just temporary? Unto the day of redemption. Man, that's great. A broken seal is an indication that the protection wasn't adequate. Can you break the seal? Can you break the seal? I don't think so. Can Satan break that seal? He sure liked to. I don't think so. So we have a number of verses. We talked about justification, imputation, predestination. There's a number of concepts that we've traipsed over here. Let's take one more before we wrap it up here. What about this adoption? Do you realize you, you have more than acquittal on your hands? Forgiveness implies a restoration of a relationship. Romans 8, 15, 16. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba. That's an intimate form of Abba, like Daddy. Okay. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We have received the spirit of what? Adoption. You see... We have just left the courtroom, the judge's courtroom. We're now in the family room. We're a member of the family. We've been adopted into the family of God. It has all kinds of implications. Galatians picks up on this one. The fullness of time was come. God sent forth His Son, made of woman, made under the law, to redeem, that, that, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. We're family now. And because we are, ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba. There's again, Paul used that just like he did in Romans a minute ago, here in Galatians. That was God's goal from the beginning. God's goal before the foundation of the world was to have you adopted in the family. Ephesians goes on, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. He hath chosen us in Him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world having predestinated us into the adoption of children, all prepackaged, and the good pleasure of His will. Once a son, always a son. Remember the prodigal son, we've heard it earlier. He squandered his inheritance, but the father's love and acceptance was not contingent on the son's works. He never lost his sonship. Let's remember that. Romans 8 continues, For we have not received the spirit of bondage again into fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. 
Always? Not quite. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. There's a hint here, and we'll be developing this in future studies. I like to alarm people by saying most Christians, when they get to heaven, are going to be disappointed. That gets everybody a little uptight. Because we've all been taught that, gee, if you're saved, you're going to reign with Christ. It doesn't say that. If you're saved, you have the opportunity to inherit and be a joint heir and so forth. There is a rewards issue, and that's a subject of another study. Paul does a strange thing in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. He says, I keep my body and bring it unto subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself might be a castaway. What does Paul mean by that? I myself should be a castaway. It, what's he afraid of? Paul, you read his letters, you can tell he's paranoid. He's frightened. What's he afraid of? Losing his salvation? Heavens no. He wrote the book on eternal security. It's called Romans 8. What was Paul afraid of? Not losing his salvation. He's talking about the judgment seat. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all, we're talking about saved people, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He's not talking about unbelievers, he's talking about believers here. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done, whether it be good or bad. There is a judgment seat coming. We, the first thing after the rapture, I believe. How is it going to be handled? That's explained in Paul's first letter to Corinthians chapter 3. Judgment seat of Christ. Sometimes called the Bema seat. 1 Corinthians 3, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, and there's two groups, gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, stubble. The first group is flammable, inflammable, uh, or, or inflammable, not flammable, and the second group are flammable. Every man's work, notice it's the work that's being judged here, not the man. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Some of those are flammable, they'll get consumed. Some are not, and they're going to endure. It's going to be revealed by fire. This is not talking about the fire of hell. It's an idiom here to, to, to evaluate the works here. Okay? Gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, a stubble. Going to be revealed by fire. And then it goes on to explain. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. Praise God. And I suspect that's going to be all over the map. There's small ones and big ones and all kinds. There's five crowns and a bunch of other things to talk about. That's another study we'll get into. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yet so is by fire. That is like a refugee. It's like you've, like you've been in one of these hurricane things. You've left, your house is gone, you're everything, you but you're, you're, you're alive, but that's all. See? You're saved. He himself shall be saved. Don't confuse this judgment with having anything to do with your salvation. It has to do with your rewards. If we're made partakers of Christ, we are, for we are made partakers of Christ, hypnoticoi, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. There is a condition. There are rewards for faithfulness. Some are entrusted with special privileges. Some are not. Some reign with Christ. Some won't. Some are rich. Some are poor. Some are heavenly treasures on their own. Some not. The whole point of all this is behavior matters. Your behavior doesn't save you. You're saved by Christ alone. But your behavior will impact your future, your destiny in the millennium and beyond. There's two kinds of people. There's going to be sovereigns and, sur and subjects. There are some caveats here, though. You're not under the law. The Messiah is the fulfillment of the Torah. Don't forget that. Avoid a works trip. You want to walk by the Spirit, not the flesh. People that get into rewards start making lists, you know, attending Sunday school regularly and exchanging the chairs, giving out tracts. No, no, that's all in the flesh. Walk by the Spirit, not the flesh. Sin is not to reign anymore. You have the Holy Spirit. There's no excuse for you. You can drop on the Holy Spirit at any, any crisis that you meet. That means you have the opportunity that sin should not reign anymore in your life. Walk with him. That means don't get ahead of him. Don't fall behind. That's the challenge. What is your action plan? We've spent a little time here. What is God calling you to do? Every one of us are saved for a purpose. He predestinated it for a purpose. He has an election for a, a job for you. I'm going to suggest you need to raise, every one of us, me included, need to raise the bar on a personal walk. And if you're going to do that, it can involve a lot of things, but one thing for sure it will include. Commit to a systematic program to really learn your Bible. 
Well, I read it every day. Of course, that's the devotional. I'm not talking about that. Get into a program. I had one of the most heartwarming trips. I went around the world here recently. I spoke 40 times in 20 cities, and I was stunned with what I found. I, attended, I was in cities that I've never been before in my life, packed venues, and uh, people familiar with our materials, but I asked, how many of you in the audience are meeting during the week in a small group to study the Bible? And 70% of the hands went up. That's a statistic you don't see reported in any of the statistical assessments here, but that's the, the Holy Spirit is moving across America and across the world in grassroots. That's not something that someone has promoted. It's happening by the Spirit Himself. That's the most exciting thing I've seen. People are getting serious about the Word of God. You need to get into some form of systematic program, go through it verse by verse, book by book. When you've gone through the whole thing, go through it again. So do it. Uh, there's nothing more in my 60 years as a Christian. The place I've seen people grow is in small groups, groups small enough where you can ask a question without embarrassment. The Holy Spirit will move in those. Get into a small study group. Sometimes it's a neighborhood thing. Sometimes it's businessmen meeting Thursday before breakfast, whatever, whatever format. But respond to his calling now. Now our next session, by the way, to finish this out, we're going to address, among, we're going to address some of the problem areas, but at, we're, the most perplexing passage in the entire Bible will confront us in the next session. And uh, what is the barrier to repentance is the question it's going to raise. And whose repentance are we talking about? And then we're going to indulge in a tour de force of seven questions that says it all. And any time you're down, you can go to those seven questions, and it'll lift you up. So I want to highlight some resources. Obviously, the, the book, uh, The Kingdom of Power and the Glory, that this is one of a series, has supporting series with it. Nan has a series on, on uh, the book, and uh, this is the first of a series that I'm doing on the, that material. But the other thing I want to encourage you to consider is get into the expositional commentaries, especially Romans, Ephesians, uh, and Hebrews as a root, root uh, uh, commentaries dealing with these very issues. Other recommended references that we find very useful, of course, the little book, Eternal Security by Charles Stanley is one of the best I've seen. He really does an excellent job of wrapping that up and communicating it so well. And the other uh, piece of work that has influenced us greatly is The Reign of the Servant Kings by Joseph Dillo. And so those just a couple. They're full bibliographies with the other materials. So let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you have chosen us before we have chosen you. We thank you that you have chosen to have us here at this point in time. We pray that your purpose would be accomplished in each of us, that we each might grow and grace the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, that we might come to fully comprehend the extremes that you've gone to, that we might have life, that we might be welcomed into your forever family. As we commit ourselves without any reservation whatsoever to our coming King, Yeshua, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Koinonia House is a nonprofit Christian ministry that is supported by the purchasing of materials and donations. To learn more about Koinonia House and the materials that we have available, visit khouse.org. And please be responsible in the sharing and dissemination of this information and respect the copyrights therein. Thank you.